seven and a half years ago, my daughters disclosed that their father was sexually molesting them. At that time, we were going through a divorce, and I had been the primary caretaker of my daughters all of their lives. I was a stay-at-home mom and did everything that they ever needed done and was a very good mother, and I'm a very good person. However, when the allegations of sexual abuse came out, the children were taken from me and given to their father, the one that they accused of sexually molesting them. Um, and uh, I was put on supervised visitation. The more that they disclosed to supervisors and other doctors, then the more the court took them away from me until they have now not allowed me to see them at all for six and a half years. My husband became increasingly abusive in 2003 and I ultimately had to have him arrested for attacking me in bed while I was sleeping. He said, I'm going to make your life hell uh, because you left me. You're my property. You had no right to leave me. If you leave me, uh, you, you know, I'm going to put you through hell. I'm going to teach you a lesson. And uh, after about a year, he started telling me I'm going to take your kids away because then he figured out that's the way he, he really can put me through hell. My daughter said that she was being hurt, scared and violated by her father, who had a judicially documented history of such problems. He had asked our son if there was something he could change about his parents, what would it be? Uh, our son had said, I'd like my mom to cook better food. I was vegetarian at the time. And he asked that his dad stop hitting him on the back, neck, and shoulders. Uh, our daughter was sitting with me tub side as I was draining the tub from her brother's bath. And she had stated, that whenever she takes a shower with her dad, the water drips off his penis and it looks like he's peeing. And I asked her, when was the last time you had a shower with your dad? And she said, this morning. Every time my son got naked, whether it was in the front yard pool or in a bath or even changing a diaper, my husband would get the camera and start filming. My daughter's two and a half. She comes home from an uh, unsupervised visit with her father. And she says her bottom hurts, and I take her to a doctor. The doctor examines my daughter, and my daughter says, you know, don't put your fingers in there. And the doctor says, why? Um, has anyone put their fingers in there? And she said, my daddy did. The physical examining doctor spread my daughter's legs apart, pointed to her vagina, and asked her, did anybody ever touch you down there? And my daughter said, as a little seven-year-old, spontaneously, yes, my daddy used to. That was the end of it. That was the end of all normality. Most people that know him think he's a really nice guy. He runs marathons for charity, and he's a top manager at a local newspaper. He is an attorney. He's an elected politician from a community of a million people. I thought when I met my husband that, wow, you know, this is someone that's sensitive and sweet and a romantic, a poet. He's soft, you know. He was more gentle. There's no way in hell he's ever going to hurt me. He was Mr. Yummy when he was you know, Mr. Yummy, talking to all the nurses, schmoozing all the nurses, and all the nurses are coming in and telling me how great my husband is and how lucky I am, when as soon as they leave the room, he's sitting next to me, masturbating under his jacket, and I'm in full-blown labor. I had no idea this was going on until it happened to me. Not even a clue. I lived a regular life. I had a regular job. I was a regular mom. I am what I've come to realize a typical battered mom. It does seem to be remarkable how many women are bright, articulate, educated. I, I was those things. I had a really respectable job when I met my husband. I was involved in politics, knew the governor well, had a political position. I lobbied for a state agency, was well respected, owned a home, drove a nice foreign car, um, traveled, had all those nice little things in life. I met my husband. He swept me off my feet. We were married before I could blink my eye. Before I knew it, he was battering. People said, well, didn't you see the signs? And it's just like, no, not before I married him. He was 
caring and he was like the rescuer type. I never thought in a million years that he would ever do this. When we initially went into the shelter, I didn't see myself as a battered woman. Um, two weeks prior to going in, I donated maternity clothes and kids clothes and all sorts of items thinking I'd like to volunteer here someday. And then two weeks later, we were wearing our old clothes and playing with our toys. I fought that back and forth, that personal battle within myself. Do I try it? Do I stay? Do I leave? Do I make that jump, that leap? One day, when my son was about three months old, I saw him violently shake him. And I thought, there's my decision. I have to go. I want them to understand that when they tell victims to leave, that they're frequently having them jump from the frying pan into the fire. Once we physically remove ourselves from the harm, in a lot of ways it gets worse. I got to the court uh, and filed for divorce against my abusive husband. And uh, then it's all started that instead of living in the hell with abuser at home, I started living for the hell the, in, created in a court. None of the domestic violence things were, were dealt with at trial because they basically said, you tell people this happened to you, they're going to think you're not. They have this preconceived notion. It, it's against you before you get into that courtroom. There's, there's something wrong with these judges. They look for the woman to be the bad person and they completely mitigate and ignore all the evidence that's before them about just how, how violent these men are. I'm held to a higher standard than her father is held to and um, basically within the court system there has never been accountability. I break down once I'm emotionally unstable. If I go seek um, a therapist for, you know, to help me out for a moment for two sessions then I'm crazy, you know, or if I, I took up a second job and now I'm a workaholic who I never see my children so everything is used against me. My attorney tried to get me to settle and I said, no, he's abusive. And he's, my attorney claimed that all women claim abuse. Um, I wasn't very happy with that. And the law guardian tried to get me to settle and said, well, you're young enough to have other children. Just give him the children. We got tape recorded conversations of the abuse and violations of orders of protection and the judges didn't care. And I was very confused. Why wouldn't they care? I'm offering them evidence. And the only reason we had it on tape is because the first time he abused her, the judge said, I don't believe you. You're a, an angry woman going through a divorce. Well, if anyone would have told me, I would have never believed them. You know, how would, if somebody told me I was going to lose not only custody, but all communication, I'd have bet them any amount of money that they were wrong. You know, how, how can you have three court orders, three orders of protection, affidavits attesting to the violence, um, police reports naming the father as the offender, and a child saying she's being violated or scared in some way, and they take her from me? Women of domestic violence are encouraged, even on the court websites, to leave these guys, to get safe, to get their children safe, because the children are being abused. My children are very emotionally abused. When you get to the court system, they don't let you leave the guys. They keep you tethered to them. Every time I went to court, there was just something more dire that came out of it. So I, I went to every local station in Atlanta. I went to um, the newspapers, every paper that I could. I was calling up the major media. They were telling me, oh, this goes on all the time. I said, but nobody knows that. You're not doing stories about that. Then they further tell me, we're not allowed to. I extended my outreach then to all of the news magazines, to Oprah and to um, 48 Hours and I, every, every person that I could find on the internet that had anything to do with talk radio, talk TV, I sent my story. I couldn't get anybody to respond. They're emotionally beat up, they're financially beat up, they're legally beat up, and the last kick in the teeth from the judge is to take her, their children. Emotionally I'm drained, physically I'm drained. And I thought that if I did this 
and I went to court and told him why I was doing it. That someday she would look at me and say, Mama, you try it every way you can. We go through life and we celebrate their first, their first steps, their first tooth they lose, but we've, we never celebrate their last. And it's funny because I'm not able to celebrate either right now. And I, I don't think I would have ever thought about celebrating their last if I wouldn't have missed it. I have the Air Medal. I flew in Desert Storm 15 missions to the Persian Gulf as a C-5 flight engineer. So you would think that they would treat a returning veteran with a little more respect and give a little more credibility to someone who has served her country for 27 years and also as a letter carrier for 19 years rather than an abuser. I was an international athlete so you know I represented this country in the Olympic trials um, twice. I was in the military, hurt my knee in Iraq the first time around. Uh, hurt, um, so I'm a disabled veteran, and I guess what just really throws me is that I feel like the Constitution and everything this country's made up on has let me down when I, I felt I've given so much back. I want to change the system so it doesn't happen to our children and our children's children, because if it's this bad now, what's going to happen in 20 years? This is the best kept little secret of the family courts, the best kept dirty little secret of the family courts, because it works for the courts. I believed in a system that I've discovered doesn't work at all. And I just find that was the second re-victimization to be completely disillusioned. I, I believed my husband when he said he would destroy me and he would try to move my children far away from me where I would never see them again. I believed that when I got into the court system that it would protect me and it failed miserably. I want them to be heard. I want them to have a voice. I want them to be safe. That's why I left. I've never asked the court to protect them for me. I've asked them to allow me to protect them and they've done nothing of the sort. Going through this, um, you know, going through the marriage with a man who was so verbally abusive and then finding that he had abused my children and then fighting for the lives of my children has um, devastated me. And then for six and a half years, not seeing my daughters at all and knowing that there was someone who has hurt them and continues to hurt them and separate them from the only love that they've ever known um, has just ripped me to shreds. I don't stop thinking of my children. It's very, very hard to get on with your life when you know that there is no finality here. If my children had died, I would be grieving and I would be thinking of my children, would, but I would have been able to go forward. But because my children live and I love them and I know that they're in harm's way still, I can't go on with my life. I have to continue fighting.